filming venue today, so uh, get it all straight. Praise the Lord. Oh, let's pray as we uh, hear from God's Word. Father, we love you so much. We just praise you for your glory and grace, and we just ask that you will teach us once again through, through the glory of your Word and through your majesty. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, it was a... Uh, um, it's been appropriate that we've sung a few songs about Egypt and the deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt the last uh, couple of weeks. One of the things we talked about a long time ago when we were actually going through the first 11 chapters of Genesis. So this is a couple of series ago because just, uh, and I know not everyone was here for those, but um, we went through Genesis 1 to 11, then we did the Gospel of Mark, then we got back to Genesis. But when we had our introduction to the book of Genesis, one of the things we talked about is how the book of Genesis was written against the background of the Exodus generation. What I mean by that is Moses, who put together the book of Genesis under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, his original audience was the generation of Israelites who had come out of Egypt. And so... Um, you know, it, it's not that Genesis wasn't written for our benefit, and it's not that you and I should not look to the book of Genesis for what we can learn from it, but it is also just worth being aware of the fact that it was written for a generation of Israelites, and sometimes their circumstances can help us understand why God explained the things he explained in the way he explained them. So, the... Israelite generation who had come out of Egypt, they had been delivered from slavery. And if you read the book of Exodus, you, you realize that they had cried out to God because the slavery was terrible. They were being afflicted by these Egyptian slave masters. But God delivered them from that through, through his miracles, through his power. He brought them out of these... Uh, he brought them out with, by these plagues. He, he essentially conquered Egypt. He showed his superiority over all other powers. And yet, when the Israelites get out of Egypt, things were not always easy for them. And oftentimes they would fall into complaining. And when they would fall into complaining, what, what, what we might call what they often did was looking back. They had a tendency to look back and... and Sometimes when we're in difficult circumstances, we have a tendency to look back at what came before, and it may have been even something that we really didn't care for, but, oh, I wish I could be there. I wish I could be in that situation now. Slavery is really, really, really terrible, yet sometimes these Israelites, when they would come into difficult situations, instead of remembering God's past deliverances, they would remember, oh yeah, but when we were slaves in Egypt, we always had enough to eat, and we always knew where our next meal was coming from. Uh, one such example is in Exodus 11, in verses 4 to 6. This is just a, a description of the Israelites looking back at Egypt and wishing that they could be back there. It says in Exodus 11, starting in verse 4, the rabble with them began to crave other food. Again, the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat! We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost, and also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. The manna was miraculous bread from heaven that the Lord brought down every day to feed them. And incidentally, the reason they didn't have to pay for their meals in Egypt is because they were slaves. They didn't get paid for their work either. But they, they had selective memory because they wanted God to just make everything easy. And, and there's an important analogy here. Because we as believers have been delivered from slavery to sin, but when things get hard, sometimes there can be this temptation to look back to what things were like before Christ, and to think, oh yeah, but, but, but things used to be so much easier. And God's message to ancient Israelites and his message to modern-day believers is essentially the same message he gave Lot and his family, including his wife. And the message is, don't look back. When God delivers you, when God pulls you out of darkness, when God uh, takes you away from his judgment, 
don't look back. We might mention that looking back can have consequences. We saw that again and again in the book of Exodus, and uh, it's something we really need to be learning from. Well, in our sermon today, we're getting back to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be destroyed, but in his grace, God is delivering Lot and his family, primarily for Abraham's sake. And we see what happens today when Lot and his family escape Sodom and Gomorrah. We are in Genesis 19 and beginning in verse 15. And the text tells us, With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry! Take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. Now that's where we left off last week, so that verse was also the last verse of last week's sermon. Verse 16 continues, When he hesitated, the men grasped his hands and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives. Don't look back. Don't stop anywhere into the plain. Flee to the mountains, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes, and you have shown great kindness to me by sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me, and I'll die. Look, here is a town near enough to run to, and it is small. Let me flee to it so that my life will be spared. It is small, isn't it? He said to him, Very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly, because I cannot do this thing until you reach it. That is why the town was called Zoar. By the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in these cities and also the vegetation of the land. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain. He saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham. He brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. Last week's sermon, as you remember, we went up to verse 15, and and the the first part of this chapter demonstrated the depravity of Sodom in particular, but by extension, Sodom and Gomorrah, and helped us understand why God's destruction and why God's judgment would come. The destruction, of course, we see actually comes in today's passage. Now, this is one of the examples of a major biblical theme we see that oftentimes God will remove the righteous, those who believe in him, before he brings his judgment. So again and again we see the deliverance of righteous people in scripture before the judgment comes. Another example of this would be the example of Noah and his family being uh, saved, preserved through the flood in the ark while judgment comes upon the world. Another example in the New Testament would be, of course, our doctrine of the the, the rapture, where there is a future time where God will pour out his judgment on the earth during a, a period in human history called the Great Tribulation, and the church will be removed before this. And some people who... Uh, who don't understand the the doctrine of this rapture. They don't understand this is a major biblical theme of God removing the righteous before the coming of judgment. Now, today's sermon is not about the rapture of the church or the end times or something like that. If you were hoping for that, yeah, we're uh, we're not doing that, but I did want to mention it in passing. It does fit this biblical theme, which also fits what we are looking at today. 
But in verses 16 and 17, we see that when the angels are telling Lot this, and Lot has been seeing the terrible things that have been going on, he was a witness to what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he is still hesitating. Lot, Lot was a believer. Uh, Second Peter tells us that Lot was righteous. He knew the Lord, and he, he, again, he probably did not participate in the egregious things that happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, and yet he had become entrenched into worldliness in such a way that he did not want to leave the life he had in Sodom and Gomorrah behind. And he is vacillating. God's grace is so great that as Lot was uh, going back and forth, the men, which were the angels, of course, that looked like men, actually grabbed him and his family and pulled them out of the city. They, they, they gave them a little extra help to get them out of there. Verse 29 tells us that God delivered Lot and family in part for Abraham's sake. Um, Lot had a connection to Abraham as his nephew, and of course, when Abraham was interceding for the people of Sodom, of course Lot would have been foremost in his mind when he's saying, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Lot, though very imperfect, we are again told that he was in fact righteous, but he was the only righteous person in Sodom and Gomorrah. So while God did not destroy the the righteous with the wicked, he pulled Lot and by extension his family out. So in some ways, he uh, he did capitulate to what Abraham had asked for and that he did not destroy the righteous with the wicked, though time had come that in this instance the wicked did need to be destroyed. Verse 17 gives us this important, uh, this important instruction. The angels tell them, when you're leaving, flee across the plain and don't look back and don't stop. If you stop, you will be swept away. And, and a couple of times that this phrase swept away is, uh, is used in this text, and it's just this, this stark warning. You need to listen. You need to recognize that God's judgment is coming, and the effects of it will sweep you away. You don't want to be there. You don't want to be part of it. We don't know uh, exactly what the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was. We know that it says that, that, that burning brimstone rained from heaven. This could have been a purely supernatural thing where God just supernaturally rained brimstone from heaven. Some have theorized that this could have been a, a, a meteorite that entered the atmosphere, of course under God's sovereign direction, and kind of exploded and the burning pieces of it in the atmosphere fell down and, and destroyed the entire plane. And there's even some archaeological discoveries that some people feel like might be uh, hinting at that. We don't know, but what we know is that God was bringing judgment in one way or another, which would destroy this entire plane. Now, it's amazing that while Lot is being told these things, he's still negotiating. He's still negotiating for what he wants. You would think he would hear that and he'd be like, okay, I'm out of here. Flee to the mountains. That sounds good. I, I, do, want to, uh, I do want to survive this situation. But Lot didn't want to give up city life at this point. He, he asked if he could go to the city called Zoar. The, in, in Hebrew, the word Zoar means small. So the city's name was actually small, and it was a small city. And he's like, can I just go to this small city? See, it's really small, and the city's name is, uh, is Zoar because it's small. The angels did grant that request, but they instructed him to move quickly. But it, it, it's really interesting that Lot, he's just having a really hard time letting go of what he thinks he has gained. Lot kind of goes all over the place as the story of him unfolds. For whatever reason, and we don't know the exact reason, he wasn't even going to stay in Zoar very long. The grand irony is he asked God if he can go to this city. He goes there for the destruction of Sodom. But soon after, as we'll see in, in a couple of weeks, he then did, in fact, move to the mountains. Maybe he had a change of heart. Maybe he thought, well, maybe those, those angels were onto something. I really shouldn't be doing this city life. But we just see that Lot had become so confused by his engagement in worldliness 
that he couldn't just do what the messengers of the Lord were telling him. When we start to fall into worldliness, we, we, we get foggy in our thinking. We get, we get confused. The more we get involved in the worldliness around us, the more we're confused about what the right thing to do is. And the closer we stay to the Lord and His Word and His Holy Commandments, the easier it is to discern right from wrong. In verses 23 to 26, as soon as Lot does reach the city of Zoar, we are told fire and sulfur from above destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It's interesting, archaeology has suggested that a possible site for the ancient city of Sodom is an archaeological excavation site called uh, Tel El Hammam. And uh, this is in modern-day Judea. It's about eight miles on the northeast edge of the Dead Sea. So this is a place where, um, where things have actually been uh, discovered. And uh, there seems to be some evidence of a sort of a meteorite strike. Uh, one of the articles I was reading says, uh, evidence is consistent with extreme heat, blast pressures, and such were found in artifacts at this site. The area also exhibits an unusually high concentration of salt. Similar meteoric outbursts have been documented in other areas of the world. And so, and this would have been, roughly speaking, in and around the time Sodom and Gomorrah would have been destroyed. So some people think that was where it was. We don't really know for sure because this level of destruction may have not left anything behind. But, but it's interesting, we have this high concentration of salt in the area. We have a brimstone raining from heaven. Um, it's very intriguing because we're told that Lot's wife looked back and that she was turned into a pillar of salt. Now, I always kind of visualize that, and this might be correct, that God, for whatever reason... I know we don't have anything else like this in the scripture, but for whatever reason, salt was God's chosen medium of judgment. So she turned around and, you know, salt. <laughs> I remember my, um, my mom was teaching, she, she taught a kid's Sunday school class that I was in when I was a, a child going to church. And um, she was teaching through the book of Genesis, and she would build like these, these models of things that were going on. And um, she had these little clay figurines that looked like, like uh, Abraham and Sarah and all these different people. And then she kind of, with these little figurines, she would act this out as she was telling the story. And there was like a, a paper mache city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And when it got destroyed, one of the boys was, uh, was so happy because he got to kind of, you know, knock and elbow the city down and all of this stuff. And then, um, and then Lot's wife, the clay figurine, when she turned into the salt, she like, she took the figurine away and she put these, this stack of sugar cubes down to illustrate her turning into salt. And I always remember that because one of the boys who was kind of a, you know, one of these loud mouth little boys in Sunday school that always liked to make trouble, he just kept shouting, she turned into sugar cubes. And nobody was really paying attention, so I think he said it about five or six times. She turned into sugar cubes. You know, he thought that was really a, really a lark, I suppose. But possibly God just, oh, you know, pillar of salt, there we go. It's also possible that what's going on, it probably doesn't mean that he just looked over her shoulder when it said she looked back. It probably means she stopped. They're running and she stopped and she gazed. Oh, my beautiful city. Oh, the life I'm leaving behind. And very possible there was something like a shockwave blast of burning sulfur and, and, and salt from, from this whatever exactly was going on that kind of coated her in some, you know, saltish material that's flying around in the air. So probably not just that she turned around and whoop, salt, probably this had to do with the, the, the natural phenomena of what was happening in this kind of destruction. Possibly God just, you know, thought, oh, well, I'll make her into a salt statue, but probably something like this. Um, if you study, uh, if you study some things in history, one of the things we, uh, we, we learn about is in Italy, during, in the days of the Roman Empire, there was a city called Pompeii that was destroyed by a uh, volcanic eruption, and there were a lot of people there that were, that were coated in a kind of volcanic ash very quickly, and, and when this has been excavated, you can actually see actual, you know, people looking like they're in incredible pain because this all happened so fast. So, I mean, this sort of thing can happen where we get eerie statues out of, a, uh, out of an incredible disaster. But 
Again, you have to put this against the fact that the angel said, don't look back. And Lot's wife looked back. The point of don't look back is be finished with what you were delivered from. This is not what God wants. This is not the life God has for you. If this were honoring and glorifying to God, we wouldn't have the destruction that we're having. And so don't look back. This is what they were warned about. God's judgment came and when, 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 when God's judgment was common, people were warned to flee of God's coming judgment. The instruction said, don't look back. That's a lesson I think a lot of us need in our lives fairly often. It's, an, it's a lesson that the Israelites in the days of Moses really needed, because as we saw, they were always wanting to look back to Egypt and what they left behind. God delivers us from darkness into light. He saves us, but there is this temptation to look back, and looking back has a way of possibly making us long for something we left behind that was not something that was honoring and glorifying to God. Looking back can tempt us to turn from the path that God has placed us on. A few, a few months ago, we had our uh, movie night where we watched the, the, the film version of The Pilgrim's Progress. And The Pilgrim's Progress, this is a kind of a major theme in that. There's one theme where the Christian, uh, originally his name was Pilgrim, right? He comes to know the Lord and he is now Christian. But so often, He's getting off the path, and when he gets off the path, uh, there's trouble. It creates difficulty for him. That he's walking on a stony path at this one point with his, his companion, and there's this grassy path right next to a stony path, and it's like, yeah, it's not going to hurt. That's an easier path. It's going to be easy on my, easier on my feet. He gets off on the grassy path, and if you read the story or if you rewatch the film, you see that it ultimately leads to him being, uh, being caught by a giant that they call the giant of despair. It's really not the thing to do. And, and the Lord helps him out of that, but really it would have made a lot more sense to stay on the path God laid out for him even when it was difficult. And of course, the, the Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory for the Christian life. God calls us to things that are not always easy. God has not promised ease. But we need to stay true to what God has uh, laid out for us, because when we turn from the path that God has given us, it has consequences. Even if the consequences are, are simply not glorifying God the way we could have, they are still consequences. But so often when we, when we move back into just a little bit of worldliness, it's so easy for us to get pulled back in. I think of, uh, you know... I think of something like, like, like quicksand, where my understanding, I've never actually been stuck in quicksand. We just have a show of hands for everybody that has been. Oh yeah, those people aren't here, right? Because they got stuck in quicksand. But you know, from my understanding of quicksand, you know, you get in and the more you try to wriggle your way out, the more you, uh, <laughs> the more you go further and further in. In fact, you only get out if, if some nice cowboy comes and he happens to have a lasso and he lassos you and pulls you out with your horse, you know? You need help to get out from someone else. And we can, of course, develop that into a metaphor that when we get stuck in these things, we need the Lord to deliver us. But how much better not to get in the quicksand in the first place? Now, usually people who get in quicksand get in quicksand on accident, you know? I've never heard of somebody who was like, hey, you know kind of hot, you know, that looks like a nice pool of quicksand. Let me dive in and uh, take my chances here. But God's word warns us. It warns us not to look back. It warns us of the things we want to avoid. And it just can be so easy to just get sucked in thinking, oh, just a, just a little dabble in the quicksand or just a little bit of time on the, on the easy path. And, and it can drag us in so fast. One of the things we believe by faith, and, and remember that the theme of our Abraham study is about faith, justified by faith and living by faith. And one of the things that we believe by faith when life gets hard is that there's nothing we left behind that's better than the glory of Christ that we're living for. We believe by faith that he's better than anything we could have lost. Now, oftentimes it takes less faith to believe that, you know, when we're... In our, in our potluck lunches and we're enjoying the, the, the 
blessed fellowship of believers and we've all got enough to eat and everybody's feeling good. It's really easy to think, oh yeah, nothing I left behind was worth anything. It's a little harder when we get into those tough times and it's a time to keep our eyes on Christ and remember that he is our greatest goal and what he has given us and what he is giving us and what he will give us is greater than anything we may feel like we could have lost. God is merciful to his people. God spares judgment for his people. Because God's wrath was poured out on Christ on the cross, God's people are delivered from his judgment, just as Lot was delivered from judgment. Lot is an interesting analogy for us to think about in all of this, because while we see Lot was as a person who knew the Lord, as a person who the New Testament calls a righteous person, was delivered from judgment, yet his worldliness had long-term effects that lasted for the rest of his life. I made a joke on the social media this last week. Yeah, I occasionally do that. I'm sorry. But, uh, but about how if I, if I stayed on the Genesis track for my preaching, next Sunday... I would have been preaching about this uh, kind of uh, icky story that happens with Lot and his daughters, and I would have been preaching that on Father's Day. And I don't really want to preach. It's a very negative example of fatherhood, and I didn't really want to go with that negative example of fatherhood on Father's Day. So I'm going to do a special Father's Day sermon next Sunday, and we'll, we'll get to the back to that later. If you read ahead, you'll see why. But we'll see that, that, that Lot's engagement in Sodom, while he was not destroyed with Sodom, and while he was delivered, it still had these long-term effects that did damage to his testimony, his family leadership, and really had some negative effects for his life, and even some, some long-term effects, but I don't want to get into too much of that just now. main key we are focusing on is the reality that when God has delivered us from this world, don't look back at what we think we're going to gain. I think of, uh, of, of you know, the words to one of the songs we sing, and of course it's based on many scriptural themes, but it says, all I once, count, all I once thought gain, I have counted loss. Loss compared to knowing Jesus. That's the general idea, and just anything you think you are benefiting from in life that was not part of what Christ has given you, recognize it's all lost. The Apostle Paul refers to these things as, as garbage, rubbish. Whatever you thought you had, but it didn't come from Christ, it was rubbish. Don't look back. There's nothing better than him. When we do persevere even in the tough times, we have to remember there is this eternal weight of glory. There are eternal consequences in the positive for faithful service to Christ. Keep your eyes on him. Don't look back. One of the things we don't want to miss in the Sodom and Gomorrah story is that it's also a kind of a preview. I know I talk a lot about previews in this series, a preview of God's end-time judgment. We recognize that every time a city gets incredibly evil, God doesn't just send fire and brimstone from heaven. Sometimes God, God will act in judgment in a way that gives us a kind of a preview of what is going to happen in the future when Christ returns and God brings judgment to earth prior to the establishment of his kingdom. This again goes along with, the, with this idea of, 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 of a rapture of believers before the beginning of this judgment. And again, we're not going to get into that too much other than to observe that there is a kind of a picture of that with the deliverance of Lot from Sodom before the judgment comes. But Sodom does remind us of the reality of coming judgment. And the reality of coming judgment should always remind us that we need to be pleading with sinners to run to Christ to escape judgment that is coming. Back to the quicksand analogy. Christ has warned the world in his word that God's judgment is coming. And we need to be uh, like Abraham being an intercessor for sinners and like 
the Apostle Paul being an ambassador for the good news, we need to let people know, we need to warn them that God's judgment is coming. It's not in a judgmental attitude like, I'm better than you. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about how we were also headed for God's judgment. But we do need to recognize the world around us doesn't want to hear that God judges and that God does bring judgment, and he does. And, and, and one of the points we take from the Sodom and Gomorrah study, uh, story, that is, is that that is a reality. Sinners need to flee to Christ now because his judgment is coming, and we don't know exactly when all of that is going to kick off. When we read the New Testament, it seems to indicate that God's judgment, God's direct judgment is postponed in the present age. We're living in a time that the Bible calls the church age. And these kind of break through the clouds and, and supernaturally judge the earth judgments, it seems like they are, they are for the most part put off until the return of Christ. The reason is God is giving sinners an opportunity to repent. And you and I were given a commission to be ambassadors of the reality of repentance and trust in Christ so that people can avoid this coming judgment. This is talked about in um, 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, beginning in uh, verse 8. The Apostle Peter writes, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some account slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord, that is the time of God's judgment that's coming, the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed by intense heat, and the earth and all its works will be discovered." Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The Apostle Peter tells us that for the time being, God's judgment is postponed, but it will come. When we think about that reality, what kind of people should we be? How should we be conforming our lives to the commandments of Jesus Christ, realizing that judgment is coming, but God does always have mercy available for sinners? So as we think about coming judgment, we always need to think about our gospel proclamation and being ambassadors for the good news. We need to warn believers, uh, non-believers, that is, of this coming judgment. And in that way, we can have a function a little bit like those, uh, a little bit like those angels. For us, again, and I said it again and again, but, but if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and God has called you out of darkness and a life of darkness and the things of this world, and things are getting tough, and sometimes you wonder if it's really worth it following Jesus, we need to not look back. We need to take the example of, of Lot's wife, the example of those who were longing for cucumbers and slavery when God had delivered them and was giving them, as it were, their daily bread. Christ is better than anything, anything you may ever feel like you've lost. And, and we just need to pray together for the grace to believe that. A few minutes, uh, Brother Ray is going to come up, and he's going, to, uh, he's going to lead us into participating in the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is a reminder of what Christ has accomplished to save us, and it's also a reminder of, of his return. So it's a reminder to us that Christ has, those of us who are believers, he has pulled us out of darkness into light. And by extension, it's a reminder that he, he's better than anything we could ever ever feel like we've lost. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your glory and grace to us. I pray that you will.
give us the faith to believe and to understand that you are so much greater than anything we, we may ever feel like we've left behind. We give you these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.